welcome to episode 6 of Vegetables Matter. It's been a while since I filmed myself. I had a lot of computer problems. Um, I actually lost the edit for the last one, which is why it took so long to post. Um, it is, today is Easter, so it's April 21st, um, and I wanted to get in another episode, at least to record it, um, this month before next month hits, so still trying to get, keep everything together. It's a little bit strange today because so much time has passed, um, but I had already kind of prepped an episode um, a number of weeks ago, but then just had all these computer issues. So I think I'm just going to kind of stick with some older stuff and keep some some newer stuff for, um, for later. So just kind of to get caught up and then um, post another one uh, in early May. So we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah. I feel a little scattered, but I um, want to sneak in a little bit of time to, to do this. So um, I do have a few finished objects, um, but first off I wanted to talk about the film festival that we went to, the Durango Film Festival, where we had the movie um, Spider Woman's Web. Larry Ruiz was the director for that, and my husband was the cinematog cinematographer, and I did um, some audio on it, plus I just got to um, relate. So it's a film about Navajo weaving, and I just got to um, spend time with these Navajo weavers um, and spinners and dyers and all of that, and kind of relate on um, on that fiber level as well, which was amazing. <laughs> it was it was a really really incredible experience. So we went to the film festival, um, and the film won the Audience Award in the Native Cinema Program. So pretty pretty cool and awesome. Um, way to go, Larry. Um, unfortunately. A number, most of the weavers were not able to make it because they were down at an art festival in Phoenix. Ooh, that sun came out. Um, and, oh, I don't need this. Okay. Yeah, they were at a Phoenix art festival, I forget the name, um, and... Kevin Aspis won the grand prize, I think, for the show. Um, they all did quite well. I think, no, I don't, I'm not remembering the details. I think Zephyrin really got some, some good stuff as well, but I think Kevin might have gotten best in show. Um, anyway, so they did really well at that, but we were really sad that we didn't get to see them um, at, the, at the film festival. So um, one thing I wanted to mention with um, kind of this inclusiveness that's being talked about um, in the podcasting community, I know people, people say it's on Instagram. I'm not on Instagram, and so I don't really know like the nitty gritty of what's going on, but I hear people reference um, this, and I did look up the original blog and that kind of stuff um, that, that kind of sparked all of it. So I just wanted to say um, kind of along the inclusive lines, uh, a number of years ago, I watched a, a little thing um, specifically about people of color and kind of experiences they've had. And, you know, they say, okay, so what do you do as a privileged person? You know, if you are someone with privilege, what do you do? Um, and I loved their answer. I wrote it down and kind of had it as a post-it note for a while. Um, she said, you, you use your position of power to give voice to, um, she said people of color, but I would say minority peoples. Um, and I really feel like Larry did that so well in this film. Um, you know, it's it's his movie, and he's not a native um, filmmaker, but he kind of had an idea of what, of what he wanted um, the film to be, I think. And then he really allowed, as we were meeting these, these young weavers, he really allowed them to make the movie what they wanted it to be. And so I just really applaud Larry's efforts um, with that. I think he just did an amazing job at at using his privilege, um, his position of privilege to give voice to others. So um, yeah, good job. <laughs> okay, um, I wanted to include that they won a bunch of stuff. Yeah, um, so now I'm just gonna talk about um, a few finished objects I have and a little bit of spinning. Um, there's not going to be a lot that I talk about today. So, thrummed mittens. Dun, 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 dun. Here they are. Um, yeah, I finished them just in time for it to warm up, so I haven't 
worn them really and I don't really plan to. I've kept this out so that I could show but I, I actually want to turn it right side in so that it's just totally done. I even have the ends woven in. Okay, finished pair of mitts. I think they're quite beautiful. So I kind of um, mi mixed a couple of thrummed mitten patterns. Um, basically the Yarn Harlot has like a thrum along um, on her blog. And, but I also found a free pattern um, on Ravelry and I kind of combined the two. I did find it a little challenging to do the thrums. These took a lot longer than I would have thought. The thrumming took a little time, um, quite frankly. And like I said before, mine are like these little puff balls rather than these V's. I don't really know how other people do it. I tried a few different techniques and it didn't work. So um, anyway, they're cute. I feel like I have some more to learn with thrumming, but um, just quickly, the yarn is a Columbia and Columbia Cross that, um, that live up in Idaho and the thrums were rovings that I had dyed with, um, the blue is Hopi Black Sunflower Seed, the yellow is Red Onion Skins, and the green is Red Onion Skins in an iron pot. Um, but all of these were kind of like the exhaust dye bath, so I had already dyed the primary color and then just threw something um, secondarily in there. Um, oh, I did want to say, I ran out of the, the blue, the black, Hopi Black Sunflower, stuff. Um, I don't know. I'm out of it right now. So, okay. I These thrums, the thrums used quite a bit more roving than I anticipated. I have very little left. Um, I have this much of that. And then I really just have like a little bit of the green. And I ran out quite early on of the of the blue. And so what I did, I was just like, oh, what am I going to do? And I was like, I do have just some plain white. I could just put that in. And I was just like, no, that's not going to work. So, um, okay. So what happened was last time I talked about the rose petal dye bath. When I washed it out, I just got this yellow-ish, beige-ish color. Not, I was not very excited about this. I was just like, oh, yep, another color like that. That's like a classic color to get. But it ended up, I actually, when I put it with things, I was like, wow, that's actually that same hue, that same tone. I think it's quite pretty. I just had it with a few different things, and it's like, that actually works. Um, so I thought about adding it, but it's just like, no, it's different. I've already started. I want to keep going. Then I also had... This is not Targhee anymore. All of this other roving is Targhee. But um, I had this Lincoln that was dyed with the Hopi Black Sunflower Seeds. And, you know, I thought about putting that in. It's a different type of, of wool, but um, I thought, oh, you know, I could try it. It's quite felted. Um, um, it didn't quite work for me. And so then I decided, oh, I can blend these fibers. So that is what I ended up doing. I blended this plus the white Targhee. But then that ended up being looking too cool. I think the white just made it made it kind of this different tone. So then I ended up using just a titch of this to add a little bit of that warmth to it. So this has already come quite in handy. Um, and I just ended up blending the color um, to, to um, get that blue to continue. And I think it worked quite well. You can see some of them have a little bit too much yellow now. I don't know, but this one you can see has kind of a stripe of, these, of this. So um, yeah. Okay, that is everything for the thrums. Next, let's talk about spinning, because um, I did do some dyeing. I haven't done a lot of spinning. Um, I have a project on right now that I'm quite excited about. Basically what I have finished is I did indeed spin up um, the, the Lincoln dyes, dyed roving that I had from last time. So they're all in singles. Um, I put them as these balls because I thought that I was going to ply them together, but then I thought, you know, I don't know what I'm going to make with it yet. It, you know, Lincoln's quite strong. It's just a single. And so 
you know, it might work out just to keep it like that. So this is the fruit tree bark that fermented. It's this orangey color. And then this is from the Lincoln, um, lichen. <laughs> it is Lincoln, but this is lichen dyed. Um, And then this is, I kind of pulled out from the cochineal, I pulled out the, the darkest pinks that I had, and obviously there's some lighter stuff in there too, but I kind of pulled out those sections and spun this up. So I thought that I would maybe do like a Valentine's thing with them next year. I don't, I don't know that that's what it's going to be. These, these aren't totally screaming Valentine's Day to me, or at least not with this, maybe as a more muted thing. I don't quite love them all together. We'll see. I might find the perfect project. I don't know. Um, so that is spinning. Right now on the wheel I do have um, the churro that I had processed last time. I'm spinning that up. I'm really excited about it. I hope that I have the stamina to keep going because um, I've made a couple decisions. I already had a project, a crochet project that was partially done that used it and then I just um, ran out of what I had processed and wasn't really wanting to, I was, I got involved in some other things. So now that I have roving, I'm like, oh, I can keep spinning for this project and finish that up. Um, so there's that. But then in the midst of that, I realized that for the warp yarn, I didn't find any warp in Durango. Durango had one yarn shop that was really small and it didn't quite, it didn't, it didn't really have the local and, and all of that stuff that, that I really jive with. So, sorry, I keep interrupting myself. Um, so with the churro, um, I do want to create a warp yarn to do with the alpaca core spun. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. I talked about it last time, and I'm hoping that next time um, things will be a little bit farther along. And regardless, I'll bring that stuff out and talk more about that. But I am excited. I've got the churro on the wheel and feeling really, really good about it. I'm hoping to crank out quite a bit for both of those projects. We'll see how, how much stamina, though, I have and if I just want to get onto something else. But really, I want to get onto these two projects that are coming next from it. So that's how that's looking. Um, let's see. Lastly, am I already last? No, not quite lastly. Okay. Um, a more knitting, and then I do have a, um, a spinning wheel to show you as well. So one thing that I've been doing... Um, just kind of a little fun project that's always on the go and it's just really small and easy. So I'm making these, they're called a geometric baby teether. Um, and yeah, just using up little scrap pieces of yarn and making these cute little baby toys. I, I used to try to make baby stuff when babies were being born. Um, but it just got overwhelming. People were just having babies too fast. My cousins are just like cranking them out. Um, <laughs> so I kind of stopped and have fallen behind. Um, but it's been really fun to discover this. You know, these are just a lot simpler and faster to make than other like baby toys and balls and sweaters that I've made in the past. So um, this one's totally done. It's felted already. I do have two more. I do have two more um, that are done, but not yet felted. So, and then I get to trim off those little ends. Hi, sweetie. I only need a, a little bit longer, okay? Um, I have some others that are half started. It was really fun with this project to um, just go through my stash and just pull out all the teeny little bits and all these bright colors and just be, you know, choosing the colors as you go along. Um, it's It's been fun. So, that is that. With this one, um, the reason it's felted, and I'm going to save up the other ones and felt them, you know, when I have a bigger group of felting to do, because I am aware of the water usage. Um, these, I, I threw these two things together. So this is a hat that I made um, some time ago, a couple winters ago, and I really loved it. It was great. It was this awesome slouchy hat. And um, so the turquoise is just some wool that's left over from some slippers I made, but then this um, cinnamon -y, beige -y color is um, alpaca that is hand spun that um, my cousins raised. It's actually the first alpaca that I ever got my hands on because they were raising some and I tinkered around with spinning and um, 
Oh, shoot. I'm getting all self-conscious because my husband's right here. <laughs> um, so I tinkered around with spinning, and they found out about it, and they gave me um, some alpaca. So that's from that first alpaca that I've ever really worked with. But it had gotten really big. I think the alpaca just kind of kept growing and growing. And so it just, I wasn't wearing it anymore. Um, and so I've been wanting to felt it to kind of, you know, shrink it down a little bit. And so I threw these two in together. This did not work out quite like I wanted to. It shrunk a lot this way and not as much this way. Um, so it is no longer a slouchy hat, but it fits now and I do wear it now. So I do think, you know, the problem solved. It's a different hat now, but yeah, that's okay. I'll just have to make another slouchy hat. Okay, the last thing to talk about is a wheel. So I have a um, Merlin tree road bug, um, and people do kind of some pretty stuff with it. So I was wanting to do some wood burning on it. I'm not particularly an artist of that sort, so I ended up doing a trade with a friend who is amazing. Um, and. Here it is. Here. So this is um, inspired by a Paiute story um, called, I, I found it in a book, um, like Indian Legends and something, um, by William R. Palmer. And um, in the story, they, he calls it Nagas Nomon. However, um, the Paiute speakers that I know, when they identify a big horn, they don't say Naga, they say, sorry, I have, I didn't even say that it was a big horn. So, in, in the story, Naga's Nomon, it's about a big horn sheep. The Paiute speakers that I know, when they've identified a big horn, they say Nah. So, um, this is Nah. The story is not called Naga's Nomon. That's a different thing. Okay. This, it was inspired by a Paiute story um, called Why the North Star Stands Still. And in this story, um, this story was written down by William Palmer. Um, and he, in this story, calls the bighorn sheep um, Naga, but the Paiute speakers that I know um, say Na for bighorn. So, um, but I do often say naga. It's, it's a little bit easier as, um, to use as an English word than that nah. So the story is there's um, this bighorn sheep, kind of the leader of, of the pack, of his pack, um, and he loves climbing mountains. He just thinks it's wonderful. And he's exploring one day and I guess just explores a little bit farther than he's been and sees in the distance this mountain that he has never seen before. And he's just like, oh, that mountain. I need to get over there. So he travels and travels, gets over to the mountain, and it is the biggest, tallest mountain he has ever seen. He's never seen anything like this before. And he's just like, wow, that is the mountain for me. I'm going to figure out how to climb that thing. So he starts, you know, searching for a route, a way to get up. You know, he'll find a little spot and explore it, and then just like sheer cliffs. He cannot get up that thing. Backtracks, he's going around trying to find a spot, trying to find a spot. There is nothing. He's like circling the mountain, circling, circling, looking for a path, finds nothing. Finally, he's circling again, and he sees a, a route that starts going down. And he's just like, well, I got to try something. So he goes down um, this other path, and it, it turns, so it's a cave. He goes into this cave, and it's going down, down, down. But then he starts feeling, oh, I'm beginning to climb. I'm beginning to climb. So um, he's like, okay, I'm getting up, I'm getting up. He's scrambling around. At one point, he, um, you know, he, as he's going up, some rocks fall behind him, and it actually starts this big rock slide. It slides down and ends up blocking the entire passage of the cave. He is trapped. He cannot get out. And so he's just like, okay, I just better keep going up. So he keeps going up, keeps going up. Finally, he sees a light at the end of the tunnel okay, there it is. There, there's, there's an exit up there. So he's, he's going, he's going, the light's getting bigger. And finally, finally, he pops out. He's at the top of this mountain. And he, there's a little, there's a pool of water. There's a little bit of grass. He eats, he drinks. 
And then he looks around. He's like, okay, I made it. I'm here. And realizes he can never get back down. <laughs> um, so he goes to sleep. And um, that night, the, um, the wolf and the coyote, the, the gods, um, this is in the story. I don't know that this is how a Paiute speaker would, would tell it, this having the, well, I don't know. Who knows? Um, this was kind of the, the anglicized written down version. Um, but wolf and coyote, so that would be Davuts and Sunungwov, um, they see Na on the top of this mountain and... Um, And, you know, they're, they're quite proud of his accomplishment, but they, and they feel sorry for him being trapped up there. So they decide to immortalize him, and they place him as a star um, in the sky. And so that is what is the North Star. The North Star stays still. It, it never wanders around. So he's still stuck on top of that mountain, but in star form. Um, and then, that's not quite the end of the story. Oh, yikes. What am I doing with this the whole time? So, um... So then, you know, Nah had had other, other family members and, and friends and stuff. And so they look for him and they also find this mountain and they're just mesmerized by this mountain as he was. And so they end up just walking around and around and around the mountain trying to find another way up to join him and to, um, to also conquer this mountain. Um, and those are the stars of Cassiopeia and the Big Dipper. So they're constantly wandering around the North Star there. Um, so that's the story of why the North Star stands still. That is a Paiute legend. Um, so this is, now getting back to the spinning wheel. So um, a four-pointed star represents the North Star in the middle. And then we have these five mountains. These are pro prominent mountains in my valley. Um, and then the bighorn sheep, here they are. So these would be the ones going around and around, I guess. Anyway, bighorn sheep, and then she kind of went into this crazy horn stuff. One thing that I wanted that she forgot about, that I do want to talk to her and tell her that I, that I do want to add, is I would like more four-pointed stars all around the edge that, that spin around as well. So there is this. And I had already had the, the hand-spun ready for her. Um, it was some Icelandic two-ply that I had. Um, I think that is everything for this episode. Um, yeah, I'll see you hopefully in a few weeks because, yeah, I'll be recording again soon. Mwah, ciao!